Welcome everybody to the Sunday session. My name's Steve Judge, the host of the Football Network World's weekly online discussion with football practitioners around the world. Uh, today I'm joined by two fantastic coaches working at the under, under 18 level at uh, professional academies. So Henk Brugger from Peg Zwolle in, in Holland and Stephen Kirby of Leicester City um, in England. Um, before I uh, introduce you properly to the guys, um, let me just give you a little bit of an overview of today's session. So we'll be having a masterclass coaching at the professional development phase under 18. Uh, as always, we want to encourage you to send your questions in to, to the coaches. So they'll fire those in while the discussion is ongoing and we'll get as many of those to, to Hank and, and Stephen as possible. Um, to help focus your questions, we split the, the discussion into two parts. So that first part will kind of look more at the structure of the, their clubs and the under 18 setups that they're working in in terms of the number of players they're working with, the coaches, the staff numbers, and sort of the data side of things and the analysis, the benchmarking that they use around players that enables them to sort of make their decisions. And the second half then we'll really sort of drill down into the work that they do in terms of their coaching and training methods, how they work around a game day, that sort of focus then on, on when they're working with the players, if it's the level, the balance between that individual focus and then that was sort of working on team team philosophy but uh so we can get into all of that let me introduce you to today's guests so we'll start with stephen kirby of leicester city stephen how are you today very well thank you thank you for all joining uh, i believe your season is already up and running yeah we began we began yesterday our first game yesterday was um was crystal palace in the uh in the under 18s professional development league um uh unfortunate a, a 3-1 loss but um plenty to plenty to get from the game in terms of the the wider picture of where we're at in our in our season preparations at the minute so so a good game really good game yeah i'm sure we'll be sort of lots of questions and, and discussion around that um i just wondered yeah if you could just share a little bit with with everyone um your, your backgrounds Bit of your pathway that's led you to your current role at, at Leicester City. Yeah, sure. So um, I began, I began coaching um, very much. My first coaching roles were community-based coaching roles. I worked for uh, an Arsenal soccer schools franchise in the, in the local area where I lived, and then um, from there I went. Um, whilst I was at uh, the University of Worcester. I went on and uh, and did some did some coaching out in America in the, on the on the summer camps over there across the west coast with a with a company called UK International Soccer um and then when I came back from that that kind of really got the coaching bug I was I was 18 at the time 18 19 at the time I got the the coaching bug there from from working every day and uh I came back and and the previous company I was working with for Arsenal Soccer Schools turned into a and into a different name a little company called football for all and um i began doing that and then whilst i was doing that i, I had a i had a p teaching assistant role at my old high school funnily enough so when i finished uni i went i went to do that and then from there i kind of got the opportunity to go to hereford united to work in their community scheme the uh the little independent coaching company that i was working for then became the community scheme at hereford united and um that that's my that's my local club so um it was great to then that was my first full-time role in 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 football coaching really and that would have been about 2007. i was there for for four years and then um and then i moved to milton Keynes dons to take a role in the the community there overseeing the pathway up to the academy through development centers um 16s to 19s uh, college schemes and then I was there for a year and um, then that timed in with the Triple P rules and um, and the new jobs that created with that. So I was, uh, when when those new roles came out, lead foundation phase, lead youth development phase, lead professional phase, I, uh, I got the lead youth development phase role at Milton Keynes overseeing the 13s to 16s. Um, had, had a wonderful time there, worked with, was, worked with some great people, um, there at that club at that point and some and some great players um 
so that was 2012 to 2016 and then uh and then very fortunately i uh i joined leicester in 2016 just as they literally won the title um so that was a a great time to uh, to join the club there that was originally his 15s coach and then there was a couple of um moves internally and i took the 16s for a little bit and then it settled down in terms of more of a structure where the current um 18s assistant at that time became youth development phase lead and then and then i took the uh the 18s assistant role so that was kind of november 2016 and i've been in that role there there since yeah well, that's uh yeah a rich and uh seems a yeah, very uh, fruitful pathway to to uh, to leicester city there yeah sure definitely Okay, uh, we'll sort of get into a lot more of your your work at Leicester in a in a moment. Um, just like to bring in now, uh, Henk Brugger. Uh, Henk, how are you today? Yeah, I'm I'm really good. It's a nice day in Holland, so uh, it's good. I'm sure every day every day is a nice day in 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 Holland. Uh, it's raining it's raining a lot uh, the last week, so uh, we're very very happy that it's the sun is shining. So uh, oh, it's it's so it's good. Yeah, uh, 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 like Stephen there, if you just like to share a little bit of your coaching pathway that's led to your, your current role at, at Peck Zwolle. Yeah, I, I, I started uh, playing soccer at my fifth and I played it till my 30th uh, at, a, at an amateur club. That's a uh, second level of, uh, of Holland, so the top amateur club. Um, and I started uh, being a trainer on my uh, 30th. When I stopped playing soccer, I, I, I started to be a trainer at my uh, local amateur club. I uh, started as a trainer of the under 19s and they played uh, the second level of, uh, of Holland. So we played against uh, pro clubs with our amateur club. Uh, and after two years, uh, I went to, um, I went to Peck Zwolle. And Peck Zwolle is, a, is a, a, a middle club in Holland. They played on the, on the second level. So not the Eredivisie, not the highest level. And within three years, they, they became champion of the, of the uh, first division and they uh, promoted to the Eredivisie. Um, then I was trainer of under 15. Uh, I also did under 16, 17 uh, and 19. Uh, last three years, I was uh, the head of the academy uh, and I combined it with an assistantship with uh, the under 18s and under 17s with the national team, uh, but also with the national team under 20, under 18 and under 17. And um, this year, uh, because we, we combine uh, the, the job as head of academy, uh, my colleague is becoming the head of the academy and I become the under 18 coach with uh, uh, also a part of head of the academy of Peck Swallow. Um, and besides that, I, I also uh, went two trips to Aruba uh, with, my, um, uh, with my colleague to, to assist there to uh, try to, to get the World Cup of Russia uh, a few years ago. So I was an assistant for Aruba at the, at the national team, also assistant for the under 20s national team in Holland, under 18, under 17. And uh, from under 15, I had all the, all the youth teams uh, at Peck Zwolle. Um, and one, one game when the, uh, the head coach was set, I was asked on the bench with the first team. So I have one... Uh, <laughs> One uh, uh, one game behind my name in the year at PC as an assistant coach. So that's also uh, my background as a trainer. Before that, I was a teacher. Okay, yeah, I think that's um, yeah, good skill to have. I mean, say as a teacher, I mean, surely as all all coaches are teachers. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, it has uh, similarities if if you teach children uh, uh, or you teach players uh, it's it's the same you have to you have to use the same skills but uh, yeah it's it's a different uh, it's you you give them different information <laughs> but it's it's uh, it's comparable yes yeah well certainly yeah 
get uh, a little bit deeper involved in into those skills and and, and I'll probably ask I'll leave asking you to whether you won that one game in Eredivisie or not we'll see whether you got a hundred percent record but uh but first I'll uh, sort of bring Stephen back in and 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 hand the screen over to him to sort of present a little bit more give you a bit more understanding of how he works at Leicester City yeah sure so <clears throat> I've uh I've tried to um, to amalgamate sort of over time, not just my experiences at uh, Leicester, but um, but throughout really throughout my uh, my coaching career, through those uh, community scheme times, through um, similar to Henk, through my through my time in the, in the education environment, and uh, and then across the uh, across the different clubs. So for me. Um, the question I hear a lot is around what is what is coaching, what what is teaching. Um, I I like yourself, Hank, think that it's it's very similar. There's there's lots of transferable skills, and for me, in a nutshell, it is it is this helping a helping a player get to somewhere where they may not have been able to get there themselves, and and that can obviously be a huge uh, a huge variety of 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 things. But for me, coaching is is that in a in a nutshell, um, I have a slightly different view. My, my philosophy over time is uh, is um, is developed. I have a slightly different view on the on the traditional four corner model. I actually think that um, it's it's more of five five areas with with psychology being the umbrella over over everything. So, for example, if if you look at technical competence sometimes a lot of technical competence is is down to the ability of people to drill into the technique um analyze yourself concentrate um focus on the small details do it and do it under pressure um same with the tactical tactical elements are around decision making and taking pictures and uh and, and remembering um remembering movement patterns remembering pictures remembering scenarios same with the same with obviously the social, the social and psycho uh, constantly heavily linked anyway. And, and again, with the physical, sometimes physical performance is not actually down to physical performance. It's down to motivation, down to desire. So for me, I don't really believe in the four corners model. I believe in um, a, a five, a five pillar element with psychology being the, the umbrella pillar. Um, and then these are just some main, some other other main points around my own coaching philosophy that I always try to remember and remind myself of. And and these are sort of main important concepts in, in my own coaching. So as a, as a as a leader, as a, as a coach, coaching, I try and lead with those things: enthusiasm, empathy, and empowerment. I think those are those are key to getting performance out of yourself, getting performance out of the the teams and the groups that you're with and the players that you're working with. Um, again, when, when coaching, I think it's quite easy to sometimes sway out of this, this black zone, this black middle zone and, and begin to worry or get distracted or concerned with things that either don't matter or things that you can't control. So um, this is a key element in terms of what I feel in terms of your coach as a focus that whenever you can, whenever you're in a situation, it's a, it's often a good reminder of yourself to to try and stay in that black zone with things that matter and things that you can control and those those are your focus um the uh the the other picture around I, lo I love this quote from Saki in terms of i think it just simplifies the game in in what however style of play you're playing uh whatever formation um whatever whatever level you're playing around the uh the four key elements of of the game, in terms of the ball, the space, your teammates, and uh, and the opposition. If you can use those four reference points to make your decisions from, uh, and have a good understanding of those four reference points in any game at any level, then then I think if you can get players to do that, they they will end up being better players from it. And then the last little uh, the last little picture here is is my sort of um, analogy around player development and, and helping players to progress. So I think it's always their roots, their, 
their roots, the stump is their is their best attributes, and I think it's always important to um, to celebrate those and and continue to develop those. I think sometimes you can get into a situation where, as a coach, you maybe want to focus too much on their weaknesses um, and not enough on the things that are going to get them keep continue to get them noticed and uh, and develop and be more effective for themselves, for the team, for the club, etc. Then I think when we're looking at player development, the the support attributes have got to be things that help the best attributes. So, for example, if somebody's um, best attribute is 1v1 dribbling, then for me, these support attributes would be around, um, around finishing, uh, playing small diagonal through balls, uh, combination play, um, slide passes, crosses. Those would be the support attributes that highlight and develop what their best attribute is. And then I think there are always some some must-haves in their game that would need addressing for them to move up to the next level in, in, in their development. Um, so are things that maybe are a weakness. Um, but in that instance, I think it's a case of prioritising what maybe that weakness is, what bit is missing from their game that you know... Um, is definitely going to hold them back if it's not addressed. Um, sometimes that might be a that might be a physical element, and lots of times it's a it's a psychological element. Um, so I think you can't ignore that, but I think there are, it's it's a case of prioritising uh, that weakness to help help the building of the, of that tree. In terms of um, my the playing philosophy, how I like to see the game played, and like I said. I've been really fortunate to um, to work with lots of lots of great coaches and in um, in two main pro environments at, at Milton Keynes Dons and Leicester and through my times with those and your and your networking and your interaction and and learning from from lots of different coaches. The simplest way that I see the game is is around is around these things. So in possession, there's three phases. Out of possession, three phases. Um, and then in between the defending transition, when you lose the ball, attacking transition, when you gain the ball. Um, and obviously defending and attacking set pieces would be encompassed in the um, in the in and out of possession, uh, six phases. So <clears throat> in possession, uh, the create phase, creating the, the framework of the team, uh, creating passing channels, creating passing options, creating the attack, creating the possession. The maintain phase, maintaining momentum, maintaining possession, maintaining superiority, either of space or numbers. And then obviously the exploit phase is down to exploiting the, the, the gaps to finish, to create um, goal scoring opportunities. And then in, in defending transition, <clears throat> two main choices for me in terms of engage where the ball is. So that might look, that or that might be described as, as counter-pressing. Um, engage where the ball is or delay and get back into in shape to engage later on. Then out of possession, the, f the first phase for me would be the deny phase. So deny space, deny time, deny passing channels, deny passing options. Um, the restrict phase in the, in the middle third of the pitch would be around restricting the space that they can play in, restricting the, uh, um, the options, the forward, the forward passing options um, particularly. And then, Obviously, the destroy phase sort of speaks for itself in terms of uh, um, destroying the attacks, destroying the opportunities, winning the ball, emergency defending. And then going back into the attacking transition, again, that decision to either counter quickly or build possession and, and go back into go back into to this cycle. <clears throat> now, the only other thing to to make, uh, mention with this, that the that the uh, diagrams don't probably um, illustrate enough is that they're not set lines within those phases. So sometimes the maintain phase might be bigger, it might be smaller. The create phase might look bigger or smaller. The the lines aren't aren't set lines. They're probably more blurred lines than um, than set lines. But for me, that's how I see the game, um, and this is how I see it in terms of um, in terms of in action. This is some work from um, from a number of uh, a number of groups. So this again would be the create phase, creating uh, passing channels, creating the attack, creating 
um, numerical superiority, creating space to receive individually, collectively into that maintaining phase, maintaining possession, maintaining momentum. And then obviously into, into the exploit phase. Now, obviously when you move through those phases, the, uh, <clears throat> the time spent as well, also in each phase, obviously depends on, um, on your overloads, on how quick you need to attack your state in the game. So sometimes you can spend a lot longer in one phase, in one move, in the next move, you might not spend as long in that phase. It's obviously always dependent around those, those four things. Where's the ball? Where's your teammates? Um, <clears throat> where's the, where's the space to exploit? Where's, where are their, where are their teammates? So again, just a general idea in our play. This this video highlights a little bit more about wide men coming off the inside and, and creating more numbers in, in the central part of midfield, which I think is is evident across all uh, all of the best teams in the world. All the best teams in the world, I think, are always very good at that, creating creating overloads in, in central areas and um and being quite quite fluent with that. And uh, and just because that for me is the best way that you uh, organise um, and disorganise. Sorry, the uh, the opposition. Um, I have this clip in here because there's a little story with with this player here that we spent as a as a coaching staff. We spent so long um, working with this player on um, getting in at the back post when he would play on the opposite side as a wide man. Um, so we spent. We spent so long at it. It was again. It was one of those red must-haves that we had to work on. Where we said, if you don't have this, it's it's going to harm your career. So again, we must have spent two, three, four weeks um, working on that with him. So for him to score in that game was uh, was fantastic, and for him to uh, to come over and say, yeah, I get, I get why I get why I need to do it now was a uh, was a wonderful sort of. Um, a wonderful thing for for us as coaches to to see that happen. Again, there's that decision in the defensive transition to engage or delay. This would be our work in the in the outer possession um, in the outer possession phases. So deny denying space, denying time. You see players in between uh, in between passing channels to restrict forward passes, restrict um, <laughs> restrict space. So that's one example of uh, of how I would see uh, the, the press operate. And then again here in that this will uh, will sum up the um, the attacking transition phase that uh, that I illustrated whether you whether you counter or build, and obviously whether you counter individually, maybe through an individual through speed. Or, or you counter as a team in like like in um, like in this scenario here. So for me, that's how I see um, coaching as a as a um, as a philosophy, and I think they're they're quite separate. Coaching philosophy and playing philosophy being quite different. I, in coaching philosophy, how you work with the players, how you help them develop, what your what your strategies are, what your interventions are. Um, and then playing philosophy in terms of how you see the game played uh, across those across those uh, those six phases. So for me, that's that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, uh, Stephen. It's like a, a nice little uh, insight there into uh, how you how you think as a coach. And we'll uh, we'll get to uh, dive a little bit deeper into how that how that looks on a day to day basis. Uh, after we've uh, heard about Hank's work at Peck Zwolle. So I'll hand over the screen to Hank Brugger. Yeah. Uh, I have a totally different presentation, but I hope uh, the same informative. Um, I'll start here. Do you see the... Yep, that's uh, looking all good. Right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, I want to introduce you uh, to Pexwell, the Youth Academy, and a focus on uh, under, under 18 this year. Uh, Pexwell is in the center of Holland, and um, in our surroundings, we have uh, some other uh, professional clubs who are also scouting in the same area as we do. Uh, you have Heerenveen, you have Emma, and you have Twente, Vitesse, uh, and Almere City. And in the center, there are we. Uh, we are a relatively uh, small club. Um, we have a, a, a small budget if you compare it with, uh, with uh, Ajax, uh, PSV, Feyenoord, AZ. Those are the bigger clubs in Holland. And uh, we have a, a really small, uh, um, we are a really small club if you compare it with Leicester City or other uh, youth academies in, uh, in England. Uh, our first team is playing in the Eredivisie. Um, so if we uh, want to stay in the Eredivisie with our, uh, with our own club and also with uh, our own youth players, yeah, we have to be distinctive. Um, and in our area, we have to be dis distinctive against all the other pro clubs in, in, in Holland. Uh, and the way we think we are distinctive is the way we play, but also the way uh, we have our uh, program uh, set up. Because for every player in our youth academy, we have a, a day program and we have a unique collaboration with, with the school. Uh, and the school is also on the, on the training grounds of Peck Swallow. Uh, it's, a, it's a school that's called Center for Sports and Education. And there are not only uh, soccer players on that school, but there are also other top sport uh, um, uh, children uh, from basketball to individual sports. There are in total 17 top sport educations. And all these athletes are training during the day. So they start the day with training from half past eight till 10. And after their training, they go to school and they are at the same, are in the same classes. And after school, they have the second training of the day. So with the under 18, we train Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, two times a day. And on Wednesday, they have a day off. So we have eight trainings in the week. And on Saturday, we play our games. And this is a, a collaboration who uh, is unique because no other club in Holland has this collaboration with the school. So uh, there are a lot of players who are choosing for our academy because of this collaboration, but also uh, the way we are organized. Um, this is our uh, structure of our youth academy. Uh, we have uh, uh, an academy which starts with the under 10 and ends with the under 21s. Uh, we have in each age group uh, a team, so under 10 till under 18. And above the under 18, we have the under 21s. And in England, I know you have the under 23s, but in, in Holland, uh, there are the under 21s. And, in Holland, it's, it's normal when a player is uh, 22 or 21, he needs to be in the first team. And if, if the player isn't in the first team at 21 or 20, uh, then uh, yeah, he isn't good enough to play in the Eredivisie. Because uh, yeah, in, the, in the Eredivisie, the, they are playing a lot of young players, also young English players who do, don't succeed in the Premier League or the Premiership. Uh, so they come to the Eredivisie, and I think the Eredivisie is a, is a great development uh, competition for young, talented players, so also for our young, talented players. Um, my role is, is head coach of the under-18, but beside that role, I'm also responsible for the total youth academy. So during the day, I'm busy with under-18s, but also busy with uh, coaching the other coaches and helping to structure the youth academy uh, in Zwolle. Um, so that's my role. Uh, what's our vision on the game? Uh, style of play in the youth academy. We want to uh, have an offensive style of play. Uh, for us, keeping the ball is the most important thing because we think every young player wants to be uh, in football to have the ball and not to run after the ball. Uh, so uh, keeping the ball is for us the most important thing. 
we want to do it in a high intensity and with a lot of speed. Um, how do we want to do it? We want to do it by dominating the game in, in passes, but also in possession with corners and with goals, so attractive football. Uh, we always want to build up. I think it's the same at Leicester. We want to build up from the back uh, through position play, uh, a lot of short passes, a lot of variation on the half of the opponent. Um, we use several game principles to, to, uh, to play this game. And uh, from the under 18 to, to the first team, the, the game plan is for 90% similar. So um, our game plan from the under 18 looks uh, for 90% the same as the under 21s and the, uh, the first team, because uh, if a player is good enough and he is only 16 or 17, uh, he's going to play at the first team. So he needs to know what, what he needs to do during the game at the first team, but also on the 21s and on the 18. So if a player is good enough, we, we push him through to an older age group. Uh, the biggest example of the Pexwolle Youth Academy, maybe you know him, is uh, Sepp van der Berg. Uh, he plays for uh, Liverpool. Now he plays for Preston North End. He's on loan to Preston North End. And uh, yeah, he's, he's, uh, he was 16 in a, in a few days uh, when he uh, had his debut at the first team. So, uh, and we hope a lot of other players will, will make their debut. Uh, this season, we have uh, 12 youth players in our first team and four of them are playing uh, every game and eight of them are playing in under 21 or playing uh, and training with the first team. So we're very proud of that. Um, what's important for me uh, by uh, working with under 18 players, um, the most important thing to, is to improve the individual, physical and technical characteristics, uh, increase mental re resilience and awareness of your own professionalism. professionalism. So it's a difficult word. <laughs> Awareness of important tactical concept and optimized periodization at the team and individual level. Uh, how do we want to do it? Uh, in the individual programs, we have uh, uh, eye on nutrition of every player, power and agility, flexibility and stability. Uh, the education is for us very important because 99% of our players won't succeed as a professional player. So education is also very, very important for us. So they have to uh, get their degrees, even if they're 18, 19 or 20 and playing for the first team. Uh, Pek Swolle is very keen on, on getting their degree. So education is also uh, in the program of every individual player. Mental training, video analysis, uh, walk and run training, but also class training. Class training is an uh, optional training for every youth player uh, of the under 18s. Uh, they can choose uh, uh, um, a, a training with a, a, a professional or a, a specialist within the academy. It could be on mental part, it could be on technical part, it could be a tactical part but uh, that's an individual training during the week on Thursday in the afternoon. Um, once a month, we have a masterclass training. All the talented players of under 16, 17 and 18 train together and they get the training from our first team coach, Art Langere. So the masterclass is led by our head coach uh, of the first team. So uh, all the trainers of the first team see our most talented players during the week of during the month. And um, yeah, we, we discuss about our youth players every month. Uh, in team, we have uh, eye on the technical skill training, power training, fitness and conditional training. Uh, if you're good enough, you train with higher teams, uh, video analysis in line, but also in group uh, and mental training in group. And we use uh, during the week, uh, uh, a lot of data. Um, for GPS, we use Johan Sports. Uh, we have for every individual player their game reference. The, the best four games, uh, the average of the best four games is their game reference. 
and we see what they're doing during the week. And our focus is on uh, uh, the total distance of every player during the week, the high intensity runs, the sprint distance above 20 kilometers per hour, and the X cells and the D cells. Uh, besides that, we, uh, we have once in six weeks and uh, uh, heart rate measurements. Uh, besides that, every six weeks, uh, anthropometry and every day the wellness and the RPE. So every morning uh, our players have to fill in the wellness, how they're feeling, how, they're, uh, uh, how they slept. And also after every training, they have to fill in a form uh, how uh, they uh, uh, experience the training of that, uh, of that moment and of that day. So we have a lot of data that we can use and to, to talk with the individual player, but also to talk with, uh, with the team. And uh, that's how we guide, try to guide our under 18 players. And it's the same at the under 21s and the first team. So it's a total package for every individual player, but also for every team. And that's how we are organized at uh, a small club at Swallow. I hope um, it was good to follow. No, yeah, nice and easy to follow. There's lots of uh, lots packed full of information there for us all to uh, delve delve into. Um, before I before I start fly throwing questions at, at you at you both and, and obviously feeding in those questions from from the audience, just wondered on on the back of those presentations whether there were any specific questions that you'd like to uh, to throw it at each other to kick us off yeah Hank, i i have one for i have one for you in terms of uh i'm uh i'm quite intrigued with uh with the school idea on site and the um uh lots of other people training to be um elite sportsmen and women in their in their um in their own fields um what ages I have two questions on that. What ages um, are at that school? What age children go, go to that school? Yeah, we have primary school in Holland till the age of 12, so, uh, or 11. Uh, from the under-13s to the under-21s, those, those uh, players are at that school. Uh, and we also have a collaboration with um, other schools in Zwolle. So if... Uh, a player gets his degree in secondary school. I don't know how you call it in, in England, but if they get their degree, they can learn after that also at another school in Zwolle. So we have a collaboration with that, with several schools, but this is a school who is on the property of Peck Zwolle. And there are 17 other, other top sports. And uh, in the surroundings of our stadium, there are a lot of possibilities to 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 train in other sports, so it's judo, uh, um, but also horseback riding, uh, uh, and it, and they are also um, training on the top of their uh, of their sports in Holland. So there are a lot of trainers who are the best in their area uh, on that school. So we have also a lot of talk with each other. Yeah, hockey is a good example. They they have um, also a lot of data. They use a lot of data and, and, and using it on uh, in, yeah, from under thirteen to under twenty one. And um, and whilst your whilst your players are at that school in the day, so you said they train before and then they go to school throughout the day and then they train in the evening uh, or late afternoon when when your players are at that school do they have the opportunity to um to play lots of those different sports and if so do you find whether i i imagine that would help your players uh physical skills quite a lot to be able to do that is that would i be right in saying that yeah we have uh our under 13 14 and 15 players uh they they we use uh, the athletic skill model and they get uh, they are doing a lot of different sports during the during the week. So uh, in a critical phase of, of their growth, 
they are uh, we are using other sports to to yeah to influence them uh, to become a better mover uh, because um, yeah in Holland they are uh, mostly behind uh, behind the screen and they don't play a lot outside so we find it very important to to help them um, uh, physically to to do other sports by catching a ball throwing a ball but also climbing and, and falling and making uh, uh, saltos frontward backward uh, it's very important to be a good mover because we believe if you're a good mover you you can uh, adapt more easily to to uh, different surroundings and you can also adapt more easily to to playing soccer so yeah we use other sports to influence our players yes that's great thank you yeah Uh, and likewise, Hank, I know you wanted to, uh, you had a few questions you wanted to throw Stephen's way. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very curious about uh, using data during training at Leicester um, uh, because, yeah, uh, we, we, if we look at, at, at data, uh, the Premier League is for us uh, the biggest benchmark. So I was wondering if you are using also the data of your first team to influence your players at under 18. Uh, and uh, do you have contact with the first team about their data uh, in comparison with your players? Yeah, we use, um, <clears throat> we actually use very similar, uh, similar uh, data strategies to your, to yourself in terms of the, the GPS, the uh, in in session, in game, um, their thresholds throughout the week, um, their loadings throughout the week. It's it's very similar to to what you described in terms of what you use with <clears throat> with your guys. We don't tend to um, compare them too much to uh, to the first team individually um, because because they're more of there's more of an individual eye on them so. They are their own individual um, on their own individual development pathway. So, so sometimes the comparison isn't maybe um, as relative as it could be. However, our first team setup is is um, is fantastic, and I know the sports science staff um, at our club have um, have the ability to go across and 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 communicate and converse with our first team staff and get first team data as as required, the first team are great in terms of um, their sharing and how they how they help the academy. Um, and we've got staff that um, were previously in the academy that are now in the in the first team setup. So those staff um, are really good at linking linking that process. But in terms of the comparison, the comparison between an under eighteen player <clears throat> and and a specific first team player doesn't tend to happen. What they what the comparisons will be will be around um, average distance covered in games or or average speed. Um, we may have a we may have a striker who's who's very quick, and a small comparison might be compared to to sort of um, what what Jamie Vardy may may record in in a session or or in game, but it's mm -hmm. but it's it's quite small because each individual seen on their own development pathway. You can you compare in a fully fledged professional potentially to a to a young developing player. So it's not it's not too detailed when when they compare individually. No, yeah, because we we compare uh, not on not on person, but we compare on position. So uh, a fullback has has other high intensity sprints than a, than a than a centre back. Uh, and and also a striker has other high intensity sprints than a, than a number ten or a midfielder uh, controlling six, so we we compare our data with on position what what a player needs in the Eredivisie, but also we compare it with national teams. So I compare it with my under eighteen national team in in a in a top game against England or against Germany. Uh, what does a player need? Or what does he do during the game in a national game, comparison with a competition game with our under 18? So it's on position, and 
Uh, yeah, next question. Uh, what's the main aim for you as a youth academy uh, to the first team? Uh, are there a lot of uh, youth players from the Leicester Academy uh, getting to the first team of Leicester or are they also going to other clubs? Yeah, our, our aim is um, is kind of as many as possible to to get to to get to the first team. Really, currently we have um, Hamza Chowdhury, Harvey Barnes. Um, we obviously Ben Ben Chilwell obviously moved on to on to Chelsea. Uh, Luke Thomas is in there at the minute at, at left back. Um, Kieran Dewsby Hall is is around there this season. We had two other debuts um, last year. Um, and there are a couple, a couple of other boys who are kind of have either been over there for pre-season and could possibly, um, could possibly step into that, maybe this season or potentially next season. Um, <clears throat> so it's about we had a, we had a, a, a real good successful time with Ben Chilwell, Harvey Barnes, and Hamza Chowdhury all coming kind of in at the same time, and mm -hmm. then when that happened, the challenge was then how to to keep that going. Yep. We didn't want to just have that and celebrate those three. How mm -hmm. do we can keep continuing um, that and year upon year, adding another one, adding another two, adding an, adding another three, and I think at the moment we're we're at a really good place with that in terms of the potential ones who are either there or or just there or could break through. Um, but but I have to say a lot of that is is obviously down to the work of the of the coaching staff and the academy when they come through. But a huge part of that is is the the first team's mindset to um to developing young players yeah. they have a real they have a real desire and a real pride in in helping young players come through so if they see that potential in them um the first team staff have been have been amazing in terms of taking academy players across for training and and <clears throat> and handing them the debuts um so we're really uh we're really fortunate on that it's not always been been the case um in my time at the club, there's been uh, there's been three or four different managers in my time, and and they have their they have had different philosophies and and strategies around um, around young players. And I think one one thing for me personally that I see on the continent in in, in Holland especially is um, is the desire and the want to do that as as you as you said, players in the first team at, at sixteen and seventeen and, and giving them the opportunity. Yeah. Because even with all our expertise and our experience as as coaches and support staff and stuff, I don't ever think we really really know how they will be until until you put them in the environment. Um, yeah. So it's really helpful for us as a, as an academy with with Brendan and his team um, be, being at the helm because because we know that they will um, they look for that they purposely look for that they're at eight they're at eighteens games they're at twenty threes games they're they're conversing across with coaching staff. They're always, they're always fantastic with coaching staff. So it's, it's a real good time for the club in terms of the level of players that we've got coming through and the fact that the first team are um, have a desire to 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 give young young players an opportunity. Yeah, I think the last thing is the most important thing that you have a manager who who sees young players and wants to fit them in. So. Yeah, it's the same at our club right now. We have uh, a, a head head coach who was at the federation last year, and he's now coming back to to Zwolle. And he is also very keen on on uh, young players giving the chance in, in the first team. So yeah, I think that's the most important thing that that the club um, has a main aim, and that the manager also see young players. If he, if he doesn't see young players, then yeah, you do a lot of work, but yeah, it's difficult. It's a, it's our biggest challenge in 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 English football, I think, to um to give give more opportunities to players in that seventeens to twenty ones um trans transition phase to to get them into into first team football. There are there are those there are some that are really really good at it and. Um, and then there are some where, where that's quite a quite a closed door and um and quite difficult. I've seen on occasions where there would be an under twenty an English under twenty one player um during during one of one of my seasons and uh 
he had by by kind of Christmas January time in that particular season he had played more minutes for England's under 21s than he had club football in terms of in terms of first team football so and I think that happens that can tend to happen quite a lot so for English football I think that's probably one of the best things that we can learn from from the continent in terms of um the desire and I guess the bravery to 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 put young players in and, and give them that opportunity. Because yeah. we have players that are good enough. Yeah, there are also a lot of youth players from Holland playing uh, at youth academies in England. Um, Kiana Hoover was one example from Liverpool. He's now playing for Wolverhampton, but also Ian Maatse. He's at the Chelsea Academy and he's now also on loan. I think if they stayed in Holland, they would be... Uh, 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 first player in 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 a in a at a big club at Feyenoord at PSV at Ajax at their young age because they're only 19 years old, but those players are very talented. Also, Jaden Braaf at Manchester City. Uh, there are a lot of Dutch players playing in the youth academies of England um, because they want to have a chance at the first team at Chelsea at Manchester City. Yeah, sure. Manchester City, but. The, the gap between uh, being a good youth player to become the first player at, at the Premier League, I think that's a really big gap. And I can imagine it's very difficult for you, you guys at the academy to, to fill the gap. Um, yeah, I mean, on that, I don't know whether I could bring you back to that, that benchmarking um, <laughs> subject and, and obviously that the, the difference between the two the two gaps as almost with Henk in in Holland you you know you're working from like we say basically from 18 to 21 yeah. you're looking at we're, we're jumping that that gap within that three years and I guess Stephen at Leicester with an under 23s football you're maybe working over with some players over a longer period of time to get them ready for Leicester first team football of ways just wonder what when you're using that benchmarking to, to to look at players individually their their individual pathways i mean what are what are the things that you're looking at how does that influence how you work with them and particularly when you're looking at right we're looking at this player as being a accelerated project he's first team ready now or this is a player that we're gonna have to work with over maybe one two years until because they're maybe because they're physically a late developer that all right our program's going to be completely different for them how how what's the sort of benchmarking you're using to to make those decisions you ask the question to me or to you can see? start hank i mean it was aimed at both of you though obviously you're like no. say, so are you really looking at a shorter time period of working with players i, I, I guess is the main thrust to, to what stephen possibly is no, uh, the, the, the main reason of the main aim is what Stephen just said. You don't know what a player is doing if you don't put him there. Um, so if a young player at our academy is good enough to, to and we find him good enough uh, on, on, the, on the data, but also what we see on the pitch and during training and the mental part, then we put him in, a, in an older age group. And uh, if he's doing very well there, then we put him in an older age group. So uh, till, the, till the first team, uh, the masterclass training we have once a month is very important. So our head coach is also watching a lot of youth games and we, we tell him, uh, look at that player, look at that player, look at that player. And if uh, the first team needs a youth player to train 11 against 11, uh, team technical training, then we decide as head of academies which player uh, can train with the first team. And if the player is there, they can see him play, they can talk with him, so they can uh, work with him and they know what their capabilities are, but also what their weaknesses are. And if you put them there, uh, uh, sometimes the trainers will know the player, and yeah, that's that's the most most important thing to to put a player uh, in a higher team uh, till the first team. And uh, 
uh, yeah, the, the head coach of every team on the 20 team, on the 21 team, but also the first team needs to know the player and needs to see the player and needs to feel the player and hear the player. So uh, put him there and see what happens. But what's very interesting is if you put him back at the under 18, how does he cooperate with that? Because if you put him at the first team and he needs to go back to the under 21s or under 18s and his behavior is totally different, then you have something to talk with, with, with the player because his behavior shouldn't be different at the first team and, and at the under 18. So that's, that's the hardest thing for a young player. If you were put in a higher team and then you have to go back to your own team, how do you cope with that? That's a very important uh, thing to manage as a, as a trainer, but also at a, as a, a head coach. Yeah. I mean, that sort of opens up then, Stephen, that when you're making those decisions of pushing those players, you know, you want to push as many players as possible, but you have to push them at a time where they're in a position that they're going to be able to make the most of that opportunity. You don't want too many coming back and having their confidence completely ripped away because they weren't quite ready for that, for that step up. So when you're making those decisions, I guess how much what this question I guess is leading towards is how much are you relying on objective data and how much do you have a look at your own, between the coaches, your own subjective feel for a player? There might be one or two things that say no, but other things are screaming out. Yes. He, he, they have to sort of throw them in. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a combination of kind of um, both really going back to the benchmarking, the, the bigger benchmarking tool that, that we probably use more in terms of pushing players up, making decisions around contracts and things is around their, their analytical benchmarking, goals, assists, um, regains, defensive duels, et cetera, et cetera. And that obviously differs per position. But that that benchmarking is probably used more than than the physical data benchmarking. <clears throat> so... Um, so we will use that. It won't. It won't override the decision of of, of staff, but it's it's definitely there for um, and on view and available for to help the staff make that that final decision again on either moving up or um, or professional contracts and and obviously when academy management and and technical director staff are are in there as well, they 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 obviously have um, have the access to that. Um, in terms of the the moving up element and the questions around that I think sometimes it can happen quite planned and in the times that that's happened at, at Leicester in the time that I've been here that's that's always been uh, very good that cut that conversation through staff around um, whether they're ready whether um, could could they do it the, the staff are under 23s and under 18s uh, have always been have always been really good with that so that's kind of never been um an issue in my in my position as as an under 18s assistant, I've always felt that I could uh, I could bring up a red flag. I could I could say if uh, look, okay, but you might have to look at this with this player. Um, so when it's been able to be planned, it's always for in my experience it has been quite good. But there are also times where it's maybe been out of necessity, and then kind of going back to my original point, we have a <clears throat> we have a player who. We played in the in the under twenty threes um, last season. There was an opportunity for for him to play as a as a first year um, as a first year scholar. Um, if we're all honest, it was probably quicker than we maybe expected. He's very good, but uh, but maybe quicker than we expected. But once he was put in, he, he we never had to worry about the comeback. He 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 just got better and better and better and better and better in the in the time that he was there. So. That was if we were trying to plan his pathway, that experience probably happened sooner than than we expected, but he flourished whilst going through it so so he's he stayed there and then this season he was around the first team for preseason and uh and he's technically uh still an under eighteen in terms of his uh scholar but it, it sometimes it can be planned sometimes it's um it's out of necessity or just opportunity happens to present itself. 
And then the other players that you alluded to, Henk, I think it's, I think it's really important for um, how we how we frame it and how we how we wrap around afterwards. So when players are going up, um, be honest with them as to why they're going up. Because again, sometimes they may be going up to twenty threes or first team because because they're doing well or because the manager's seen them or. Um, or it might again, it might be out of necessity, and and they want a player, and um, a player may go up thinking, oh yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing really, really well, but actually they're, they're just getting the opportunity out of maybe necessity, um, and in and inevitably they're going up. We may know as staff that they're going up to come straight back down, but the player may not think that. The player may think, right, but well, this is my chance to go. I'm going to get lots of opportunities at doing this. So I think you've got to be really, really. Uh, <clears throat> Really honest with the player, but also not not downbeat and uh, and sort of pessimistic about it. Uh, try and get that try and get that balance, and then again when they come back, um, it's it's a I think it's a tough ask for a player when they do that when they have an experience for a certain length of time and maybe a few weeks of going up to the first team, and if they have to come back, it's kind of like that feeling when you go on holiday and you've got to come back, you've experienced it for a little bit of time. You've got to come back to normal and, uh, or when you have to go back to work, after going <laughs> on, uh, on holiday, it's difficult. It's difficult for, for young players in, um, in where they are in their age and their stage to, to potentially, um, deal with that sometimes. So I think as the, as the 18 staff, when that happens with an 18, there's, there's definitely a lot of, um, wraparound support in, in helping the players do that and trying to realign their focus when they come back to, okay, so what do you now need to do to get another chance at another point, whenever, whenever that that may be, that that's easier said than said than done. I uh, I sympathise with Hank that that that's that's a real difficult um, task sometimes. Yeah. A difficult task, Hank, but um, yeah, one, uh, how how do you approach it? I mean, I guess there's going to be players who come back who've had a taste for the higher level and it really enthuses, enthuses them, um, it really drives them on and, 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 you know, and their levels probably were higher than probably when they left you. And then there's those who, as, as Stephen says, it's, you get that kind of post-holiday blues. That you've had such a great time and, and now you're back to normal and there can be a drop off, and I guess those are the ones that will concern you the most. Yeah, and and I totally agree with being honest with the the opportunities they get. Uh, be as honest as possible, because every individual uh, earns honesty. So uh, I totally agree. But it's very important if a play. Every every coach knows when a, when a player is coming back to to uh, 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 an earlier age group. So from under twenty one to under eighteen. So our trainers also have the task to 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 first talk with the player before going training uh, and talk with about the experiences he had with the first team or the experiences he had with the, with the older age group, but also uh, take him uh, in your way of thinking and 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 try to guide him and also yeah uh, tell him that you understand him when. Yeah, he's he's uh, uh, not not uh, fully focused the first two three trainings, but it's all uh, always uh, focused on the individual path he's walking. Because in under 18 and 21 first team, every individual player has his own path, and for some players it's 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 uh, a path only way up. Uh, under 21's first team, but for some players, it's under 21, back to under 18, maybe train with the first team and then going back to under 21, going back to under 18, but always take them by the hand and tell them uh, what is going on and why are the choices made that are made by the, by the coaches. So be as honest as possible, I think. I totally agree with Steven. So uh, talk with the player. That's that's in yeah that's uh, uh the most important thing uh, talk with him and be honest so i think that's the main thing we sort of move it on now and sort of see him 
when you're actually on the training pitch itself, what that what that looks like, what uh what have been your main goals? And um, Stephen, I guess as you just come through the end of pre-season, I'll probably look how how did you structure things through pre-season and to now? What are the obviously there's the physical element to begin with, but when sort of more if we're now looking at the technical tactical side, how how do you build that information up with the with the players? How you how do you look at putting those blocks together to get away, get across how you want your team to set up through through the season? Yeah, I think we look at um, we look at pre-season as a real sort of um, observational time in terms of the players uh, <clears throat> players' development because at that point of a season you've got um, two kind of obviously distinct groups. You've got you've got a group that have had one <clears throat> one whole first year, um, and 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 at that group you've possibly got as I alluded to you've got some that. Um, are really close to to either cementing themselves with the twenty threes, or even higher, close to <laughs> close to being on in in the first team, um, and then you've got those that are just just sort of starting their under eighteen season. So, um, as as with most of our stuff, it's a real uh, it's a real individual focus, and it's the key um, from a from a uh, a coach perspective, a technical tactical sort of um lens really is is observing the, all all of those players and, and and seeing where they're at and kind of um making their own individual plans that's that's how we use pre-season we use pre-season to formulate what's going to encompass their individual development plans um again technically tactically etc cetera, etc cetera. <laughs> um Use that period to do that for them. When we when we start the season, we can um, we can have those meetings with with those players and and set up where they are now. Get their um, get their view, their feedback. What 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 are their goals? Because um, obviously, a big part of our job is helping them achieve what they want to achieve in their in their own respective careers. Um, and as I said, there's, there's a big there's a big gulf between one player and, and another player. Uh, under 18s level just because of that um that two year age band in and 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 just starting out and just being close to close to first team level so um we use that preseason from a team perspective we look at um kind of maybe what what's um what's the best suit for for how we want to play so the academy at Leicester isn't isn't academy that's based on um you you must play a a set formation. It's the focus is more around the playing style rather than the formation. So um, if a back three suits best, the three at the back formation suits best with the personnel that we have. Then we've got the um, we've got the creative license to to go with that. Um, if a if a back four or um, playing with two strikers is is um, is best suited, then then we're happy. Um, we're happy that we can we can do that. There's not a set. You must play four three three, and it must be in this certain way. Um, there's quite a there's quite a good understanding again through the through the first team and how they operate. Um, they're really clear in terms of the type of player that that they want and and, and what they want to see from their players in the first team. So there's never been the situation where the first team have gone. You must do it this way. Because they're so clear in um, in their identity and the type of style that that they play for yourselves as coaches, eighteens and twenty threes, it's quite obvious that we obviously our job is to get uh, players in the first team. So it's really obvious for us to see, okay, well if we want a player in this first team, he's going to need to be able to do this, 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 and this, depending on his position, um, depending on um, on his his own abilities as a player. So it's um, that that time in preseason in, is around that really figuring out how we're going to play. Probably looking at uh, maybe even two or, or or three different ways of playing, dependent on um, the individuals that we've got available. We may have, for example, a team. Our team in the FA Youth Cup may look quite different to our regular league team because of. Um, 
on a weekly basis the the some some of those players who may play in the youth cup are either playing under twenty threes or or training with um, training with first team. So throughout the season, there's quite a lot of movement between between the groups. So getting uh, a settled side isn't real isn't really realistic for for us at under 18s and i think that's a good thing because there's there's that fluidity between um moving through the system so for in terms of individual player development and getting players in the first team i think not having a set outside every week is is better because players are getting those those different experiences um so our team and our idea is um per game is is large, largely dependent on um on what we would have available, available the individuals that we've got available, and like I said, that could differ through different points of the season. Right, thanks, Stephen and uh, Hank. I believe it may be a slightly different situation for you at, at, at Zwolle that you may sort of be under 18s and having a, the under 21s that you're more aligned with with what the first team do. Yeah, in terms of. <laughs> That's a strict tactical set. I'm not saying Leicester, Stephen, obviously made it clear that <laughs> there is an alignment there, but just with a slightly different focus. No, I, I, I uh, it's, it's, it's for 90% the same as Stephen says, uh, but uh, within our club, uh, the, the way of playing of our first team on 21 and under 18 is, is quite similar. So uh, we play in the same uh, uh, formation through the whole academy for 3-3, but the coach has his own uh, way of thinking and, and way of seeing uh, with the players he has to, to play with a 10 or to play with a six. Um, but 4-3-3 from the start of the of the game, but during the game, we can build up with three, we can build up with four, uh, even uh, dropping a midfielder in the last line. So, uh, but at under 18, under 21 and first team, uh, we play quite similar. I think for 90%, it's it's the same in the under 21s and the first team and under 18. And for me in preseason, most important thing is to give every player the opportunity to play uh, their minutes, uh, to get them fit uh, to for the start for the, for the season. Um, so we had a, a preseason in June uh it was five weeks and uh now we started at the 2nd of august so we are in training for two weeks in the second preseason, and we start at the 28th of august with our first cup game and in the first preseason and second preseason, we uh, uh train the players uh um, tactically uh so we have a blueprint of playing and yeah, we we uh, last two weeks the focus was only on defending, uh, and the next weeks we uh, we transition from offense to defense, and uh, the next weeks we're gonna have the focus on offense, and in preseason we only focus on our way of playing, so we don't uh, look at the opponent, we only look at their at our way of playing. So the the blueprint in the first six weeks. The first six weeks is for me the most important uh, six weeks of the year because that's the way we want to play. That's our game plan. And uh, we have to play that game plan with different players. So they fill it in their own way, but the game plan must be clear with the players, but also with the trainers. And during the year, uh, we try to fine tune it, uh, the way of playing. And during season, we look at the opponent, where the threats are and where the weaknesses are, and we try to, to play our game from our game playing against the opponent and try to uh, win the game because in under 18, winning a game and winning a competition is very important for us, uh, but also winning uh, um, uh, within the team individually. You have to be the best at your position. So the best 11 players uh, who can win a game play the game uh, and yeah you need to be at your best every week so and that's also the same at the first team if you're the best player at your position and you're only 16 years old then you play in the first team and if you're second you play in under 21s and if you're third you play in under 18 so 
there are three teams where you can play if you're 16, 17 years old. There's the first team under 21 and under 18. And yeah, let the, let the trainer see where you're at your best at the first team under 21 or under 18. So also the competition between players is very important from under 18 up. Um, uh, but for us as coaches, it's the most important thing to, to help them set their goals help them get their goals and guide them during the way to the first team. Uh, so it's their pathway and we have to help the individual player with their pathway and give them the minutes they need to, to get their goals. And that's the, that's the main aim during the season, but the first six weeks, uh, Blueprint, uh, give the, the players the opportunity to play their minutes and uh, observation is very important the first six weeks of preseason. So I think it's, it's uh, for 95, 95% the same as Stevens. But yeah, every club has their own way of playing and their own philosophy of playing. So that's the, that's the last 5% between Leicester and Pexwola, I think. As you're progressing through the, the season, Stephen, how, how are those blocks of training looking? How does the week look in terms of having that balance of individual development, but also putting that individual development within within a team in, environment, what it is you're looking to get out of them as a member of the under-18s and then hopefully progressing into the under-23s and, and then being ready to step into a first team environment. Yeah, sure. So after that um, initial uh, pre-season period of about five to six weeks, our our sort of curriculum, our coaching curriculum turns into into four mesos then, four kind of 10, 10 week mesos. And um, and then what we'll do over, over those mesos, over those uh, 10 week periods for each meso, we will uh we will look uh as i showed on on the uh on the presentation at those kind of six areas of the uh of the game there's there's a few sort of um slight variations in terms of um in terms of what i showed you in terms of how i see it personally and 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 uh and how it sort of is at Leicester as such but the concept is the same those six areas of the game the two transition um, elements of the game. And we will work across 10 week blocks covering all of those in possession, out of possession. And then the transition element is in every session. We don't, we don't separate that because we don't feel it's one, it's realistic and, and, and two, that you really, you really can separate it to get the development it needs. Transition is, is always there. Um, so it's something, the transition elements we highlight, um, every session, but something we, we do at the 18s at Leicester is um, myself and the head coach will uh, will kind of work with stroke against each other. So, for example, when he is working on playing out from the back, I'm working on the players in, in a high press or if we're looking at defending in a mid block. So what he's working on, I'm trying to adjust the, uh, the opposition to, to get them to challenge the team in possession. So rather than working on things um, in isolation, we're working two potential topics, testing them against each other. So that's how we try to work with um, with our sessions because we feel if um, if the defending side of it, say for example, high press and playing out uh, from the back, if the if the press if the pressing isn't at the right intensity you don't maximize the development of the playing out because it's unrealistic. You're not playing it get under the um, right amount of decision-making time and you have more time on the ball than you're actually going to get in the game. And, uh, and then it's, either, it's either too easy. And then obviously if the, if the pressing side of the game isn't up to speed, when we go and play against other teams, when they're playing out, they're going to get out more comfortably. So we, we kind of find a, a nice balance between, when when one coach is working on one thing, the other is is um, not trying to outdo. Um, it's not a, an ego thing between coaches. It's it's trying to just test the concepts of the of the in possession and out of possession in the game, 
to to challenge the players on each side more. So in in a session, also the other benefit of that is that each player in the session feels like the session is about them. So you're not just a defender on the defending side so that somebody can work on the in-possession element. You, you'll get, when you're on the defending or when you're on the attacking, you've got the eyes of of a coach with you um, and, and, and on you. So every part of the session is always about you. I think the only time we, we possibly don't have that is if we're maybe doing something game specific, you're working with maybe just the the starting eleven um and and maybe a couple of extra bodies maybe day before a game. But otherwise the session's about you whether you're on the in possession or the out of possession. Um, and likewise for you Hank, um well just to focus when you're then those when you're working within the within the group side of it, before we move on to the individual side of it, what a, what a, what is it as the, you progress through the season? How how are those sessions looking? How are you structuring them? Yeah, we have a six week cycle, and it's the same as Stephen uh, talked. But the, the only difference is uh, in pre season we, we we focus on our own game plan, but during the during the season all, all the matches of our competition are being filmed. So uh, every week we get the, also the clippings of our next opponent. If we play Ajax, we, we know how they build up, how they give pressure, how they uh, want to defend. Uh, um, so we analyze our opponents and during the week, uh, if we uh, see an opportunity within our game plan uh, to, to have a certain build up against Ajax, because we want to build up from behind, uh, then we're going to train that. And I'm the head coach of under 18, so I'm going, going to train the build up. And my assistant coach is giving pressure. Um, uh, sorry, the I'm going to give pressure because the build. No, I'm going to be the build up, and I, he's going to uh, coach the pressure of Ajax, uh, so uh, we can uh, outplay them during the game. Uh, because every every team in Holland has their own way of playing, and um, uh, the an the analysis of the opponent each week is uh, on Thursday and Friday the most important thing to train during the week. On Monday and Tuesday, there uh, are trainings who are more focused on the individual player. So uh, on Monday, we do a lot of small exercise for footwork, but also individual trainings uh, uh, to help them set their goals with passing, but also uh, uh, one-on-ones, uh, one against two uh, in defending and offense. So Monday is an individual session. In the morning, in the afternoon, we have uh, always video analysis of the game we played the Saturday before. On Tuesday, we have a conditional training and in the afternoon, we have strength. Uh, and on Thursday and Friday, we have focus on the next game on uh, on uh, Saturday. So then the opponent is also very important how they play. Um, so that's a week session. And we have a six-week cycle where also the defense, offense and the transition combine with each other. Um, and uh, beside the team training, we also have individual trainings uh, for every single player, uh, three times strength, and also with um, specialists within the academy, they can train individually in the, in the afternoon. So that's that's mostly on team level. Uh, and I have one assistant every every training. I have a goalkeeper trainer uh, on the pitch, uh, and I'm on the pitch. So. We are uh, with three coaches on the pitch, and uh, before every training, we uh, every coach uh, knows what to do, and so it, it, it needs to be 90 minutes good training, not a lot of talk, but uh, effective minutes for every player. Yeah. And I just want to maybe just share with us then a little bit more what that individual training then then looks like you mentioned uh, in your presentation that there's like a called class training yeah. where the players will pick or given a choice I maybe mean, it's a guided choice yeah um is this kind of like a buffet menu so you know they can't just pick random things 
for a block to work on that there'll be a, an option of three or four things and then players will work within groups or are you really just taking those players out and they work one-to-one -one with a coach? No, um, it's it's kind of a buffet, uh, but they, they, and it it is optional. So we give them the opportunity to, to train extra individually and they can give uh, the us their goals so if a, if a player wants to work on his uh, strength uh, upper body then we uh, we bring him in contact with the physical coach if there are three or four other players who wants to do that then we combine those players with the physical coach but there are also players who have mental problems and we have a uh, 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 sports psychologist in, in, in at Pek Zwolle. So that's a one-on-one -on -one session. Uh, but we also have uh, technique trainers uh, within the academy and those are three trainers. So uh, we asked, what do you want to improve in your technique? And if it's one-on-one -on -one, uh, and the one is attacker and the other is deep defender, then we combine those two players with each other because we believe uh, if you bring players within uh, game-like uh, trainings, even in the smallest way, uh, that's the best way of training. It's one-on-one, -on -one, it's 100%, and uh, it's against an opponent. And both players wants to, want to improve, the one in defense, the other one in attack. So those are the best trainings. So we combine uh, individual goals with each other and uh, put a trainer on it, a uh, specialist. Um, so it's kind of a buffet, but if a player doesn't want to go there, we won't push him because it's pathway and not our pathway and creation of player. Uh, of it's important for us. Um, well, I mean, likewise at, at Leicester, Stephen, do you have something similar to that, or you sort of incorporate it in a different way? Yeah, it's um, it's quite similar. We have uh, afternoon slots that um, on on usually some Mondays and and uh, Thursdays and Tuesdays where we will we call them. Uh, ILP slots, individual learning plan slots. So as I mentioned before, through pre-season, we're formulating their individual learning plans on, uh, on, on what they need to develop. It's, it's um, not optional in terms of sort of attendance, um, but there is, a, there is a choice, like a buffet choice available in, uh, for the players in terms of, um, in terms of what they want to work on. And um, it's a, it's a very, it's a very collaborative effort in terms of if we think there's something that they should particularly do, then we will ad advise or even sometimes make, make the call on that. But um, the, the, the strength of that is, is our work as um, what we call an MDT multidisciplinary team. Um, so as Henk alluded to in terms of their training sessions on, on, a, on an individual training session at under 18s, we will have, the head coach, myself, um, an additional academy coach um, who's, who's part of a Premier League funded scheme uh, working across different age groups. So um, he's great. He gets, he gets to, uh, to come in with us daily with the 18s and then for a certain period of time and then we'll go through another age group. So we've got three coaches. Uh, we'll have a goalkeeper coach as well um, along with sports scientists, obviously physio and, uh, and also uh, our psychologist is out on the grass with us, he's part of the uh, the MDT team. It was really important for us that um, when having that psychology support, it wasn't it wasn't something that was just classroom based. We we needed um, we needed that member of staff to to be seeing players um, out on the grass where the pressure is to uh, to um, have a better idea of their behaviours under pressure, um, some of the challenges that they might have. So as a collective staff. It's um, it's really well run and 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 in those ILP slots it doesn't have to be on the grass if it's something technical there's that opportunity to do that 
Um, similarly, if it, if it's something around individual clips, um, the player can sit with the analyst for maybe thirty minutes of that that hour, and then come back out and do some technical. Or if um, if somebody wants to see uh, seek um, some psych support in that hour, they can they can use that hour for that. Or as Hank said, if if uh, there's any physical development that can happen in the gym, or that can happen out on the grass. Um, so, so quite similar, but the strength of, like I said, the strength of that that session and uh, and the development of the player in that session is around um, is around how well we work as a staff. If if we make sure that works well, then we feel it's re- it's it's really beneficial for the player. Yeah, fantastic. Um, before we get into just quickly, finally, to sort of chat a little bit more about the the games program, a um, so question here for Hank. Uh, from Murray Jones, who asks, uh, how beneficial is the Erste division for uh, player development? Um, say, so opposed with clubs with playing under 21 or under 23 or B teams? Um, yeah, the, the, the first division, first division, uh, there uh, are uh, also pro clubs playing. Um, and a lot of youth players who are at the bigger clubs can play in that uh, competition. The, the B teams, uh, we, 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 we stopped playing with B teams because it was a, it was a Monday uh, competition. Uh, a lot of injured players from the first team, but also bench players of the first team were put in the B uh, B competition, B team competition, and yeah, they weren't that motivated to play in that competition. So uh, in Holland, we stopped the B team uh, and we introduced the under 21s. We had under 19, under 17, and it became under 21, under 18, under 17, and, and lower teams. So the under 21 competition is now a, a competition on Saturday. Uh, all the youth academies. The most youth academies have an under-21 team and the only four clubs who have an under-23 team playing in the f- first division, eerste divisie, are Ajax, PSV, Utrecht and AZ. Those are the bigger clubs and they play at the second level of Holland with their under-23 teams. And yeah, that's, that's the best development for those players. But if we are uh, playing with our best under 23 players in the uh, Eerste Divisie, then it's yeah, it's too hard for our players. Uh, so it's better for them to play in an under 21 competition and um, uh, train with the first team and after one or two or three years become a first team player. Uh, just a quick question then for, for both of you in terms of the matches when it comes to team selection is it purely a, a meritocracy you'll pick the 11 best players based on on you know the, the the players that you have available to you or do you have a balance there with development that you you know you have an understanding of you have there's a certain amount of minutes you want to expose players to throughout a season shall i, shall I go first hank yeah um yeah, it's a it's a it's a combination of 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 the factors really. There's for for us, it's a um, a large emphasis on uh, on the meritocracy in terms of uh, the best players playing because uh, in in our stage, probably under 18s, that's that's where they probably begin to learn that a little bit more in terms of uh, a preparation tool for if they're going to go on through. Um, through the levels, that's what they're going to be exposed to, and obviously, the hope is in that is that that fosters that competitive element and 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 desire to to get better. Um, the other factors around selection are <clears throat> are obviously around um, a little bit around tactically in terms of um, opponents, um, not too much, but we'll have we'll have a glance, we'll have an eye on it in terms of we might be better with playing wing backs this day so we might play we might play with wing backs wing backs might get in the team um that day as opposed to as opposed to maybe playing with more in midfield etc um and then 
at, at times, obviously, as I alluded to before, your your hands are a little bit tied sometimes because you the the players that you potentially would play on that meritocracy are uh, are either moving up and playing up or um, they may be limited to a certain amount of time. I, they may play on uh, Saturday with 18s for a certain amount of time and then maybe have to train or play the next day in, in preparation for the the under-23s game, which is either uh, a Friday, Saturday, uh, Friday, Sunday or, or a Monday, usually a Monday um, uh, at our place. So sometimes a player may, may be limited to his time because he's um, in contention for the under twenty threes as well on the on on the Monday, um, and then the the other element is around um, is around trying to provide also trying to provide opportunity. Sometimes you may you may not be in the team through kind of no fault of your own. Um, so so we do try and get that balance of look people get better by playing. Um, obviously we can only pick eleven, but um from the moral side of things there is a there is a desire wherever possible to try and give try and give people that that opportunity um so long as obviously their behaviors are right and and their and their attitude to to working's right so that's kind of the all the things in 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 play in terms of when selecting the team yeah, and then at Swolle, it's it's a bit the same. The, you have three degrees, I think. You have the high potential players uh, who need to play every, uh, good minutes. So every Tuesday and Thursday, we have a conversation with the first team coach, on a 21 coach, head of the academy, and our 18 coach. Where are the better youth players are going to play? Are they going to play the first team on the 21 or on the 18? So uh, those are the first players we put on the pitch, the best potentials, the high potential players who we think can succeed at the first uh, first team level. Uh, the second is uh, we, during the, the season, we want to win the competition. So on Saturday, the best 11 players play and the best 11 players uh, are the, the, the players who are uh, the most capable to play on that position. Uh, and during the week, we try to, to arrange uh, a lot of friendly games for all the other players to get also the minutes they need to develop as a player. Because um, if you don't give uh, a player minutes to play games, then uh, it's not, then the gap grows between the players who play on Saturday and the other players who play don't play any minutes so uh, and and if the game allows it you 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 change the players also during the game uh, if if one player doesn't fit that Saturday on his position then you bring in another player but Saturday is about winning a game winning a competition and during the week we try to give the players uh, good minutes uh, with friendly games against other pro uh, professional teams but also, we have a good collaboration with top amateur clubs surrounding Zwolle. So we also play against all the age groups, uh, first teams, uh, amateur clubs uh, surrounding Zwolle uh, with our players. So there are also good minutes for players. Well, the match day itself, Stephen, um, how is your, what is it you're communicating with, with the players? I mean, is there on a match day as a focus will remain very much on what you've done during the week in training? If you've been working on a specific um, tactical point that no matter what happens in the game, that's your, your focus, whether the players have performed that or not, the result is sort of secondary or on a match day it is you are focused on on the game on winning winning the game yeah i think um for for me it's really in, in my own personal opinion it's it's hard to um to kind of separate the the two sometimes i think there's more of it's more cohesive than than maybe it's traditionally um traditionally discussed for a number of reasons, I think if if we weren't uh, if we were a staff weren't um, focused on 
doing what we what we can to win the game, trying our best to win the game. Um, I don't think we would be doing our job for the players because they really want to win. They that's 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 a lot of their focus. Um, they they want to win, so I think we have to select, we have to set up, we have to um, strategize um, to try and win the game for for their sake to to help to help them. Um, and not all the time, but I think your success of that gives you gives you clues of your of your performance and your and your development. So, for example, if um, I don't think anybody's ever come off a pitch and lost five nil and come away thinking, oh yeah, we played well in that game. There was obviously things that we're not doing in that game <laughs> that that led to that led to the end result of the game. But also on the flip side of that. You might play really well in a game and lose one nil. That's that's quite conceivable. Um, so obviously, our perspective as, as staff is um, is is different, and that and that's key. I think we have the ability um, as as the adults in the situation to have a clearer perspective on the on on the bigger picture and uh, and rationalising more of the more of the how and the why rather than what. So. We won or we lost, but how did we win or lose? If we won five nil, we obviously did some really good things in our uh, in our development individually or collectively that allowed us to score five goals. So that's that's if it's um, if it's five good goals or it might be through three set pieces and two good goals. So the drilling down into the detail of it, of the how and the why is more important than the what in terms of the we won or, or we lost. Did we win well? Did we win and play well? Did we win and and not play well, and vice versa with um, with with losing and drawing? So rather than rather than separate them, I think it's just how what type of lens you look at it. But again, it's not the um, for us. It's not the winning the game or the competition isn't the the main objective. The main objective is is for us putting players into the into the first team. So there will be scenarios where we can't have our best team because those players are playing at under 23s or they're training with the first team that week or whatever. And then as, as staff, at, again, like I said, our perspective is let's keep perspective on that. We may lose the game because we haven't got our three best players in, in inverted commas, but those players are having the positive experience for their own development pathways. So if ever that's the case, not winning the get not winning the game or having less of a chance to win the game is um is something that we we take every time the the individual development um will always uh will always surpass the team winning the game or the competition but as as i mentioned i i don't think you can i think you can work cohesively with winning and winning and development doesn't need to be so much of an argument it can work more cohesively than sometimes it's made out to be i mean for you you hank i mean how does that look on a on a match day i think you mentioned uh, f- earlier that certainly the first six weeks you're just focusing on what you're doing as a team you're not you know not introducing any of the opposition analysis until later in the season so within these early games are there just specific blocks that are associated to what you've been working on in training and that will be the only focus you have with the players on a match day, those will be the things that you talk to them about. And yeah. does that does that then evolve through the season, or will you pick up on things in a game that had no relevance to what you've worked on? No, no, no. no. First of all, I totally agree with Stephen what he just said right now. The, the the main aim is to to get players at the first team and give them the best minutes they need. So if it's an under twenty one, they have to play under twenty one. But I think the 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 um, the, the, the team talk on Saturday is, is not on Saturday. It's it's during the week. During the week, you prepare the players for, for the Saturday. Uh, and, and on the Saturday, I, I only talk with uh, the individual players or with a line of players. And uh, I'm only asking questions. What did we train last week? What's important? What do you need to know? Do you have any questions? Uh, what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses of the opponent? Uh, so there are a lot of individual talks 
from me to the to the players, but also to the line. Uh, so the last line, middle line, first line. Um, uh, but I don't have a, a big team talk on Saturday anymore because I said it all during the week on the pitch. And on Saturday, it's their game. During the week, I prepare them. And on Saturday, they need to play the game. And the only thing I do also at halftime, if, if the game isn't... If, if it's going well, I only ask questions. Uh, what did we agree? What are, what were, uh, where is the problem? How do we solve it? Uh, I, I talk with individual players because 15 minutes during half time is very short. So you have to be on the point they need to know to go in the second half. And that's maybe one or two small areas during the game. So if you prepare them during the week as best as possible, you don't need to say a lot on Saturday. If you don't prepare them well enough, then you have to talk a lot with the players on Saturday. So um, that's also uh, uh, a reflection for me on, on the week. If, if they have a lot of questions, then it's not clear what to do during during the Saturday. So that's also a mirror for me on Saturday, how I work during the week, uh, prepare them for the match on Saturday. So that's for me the most important thing on a game day to, to help them and ask questions if they want to know something. So, um, but what Steven said, I totally agree. Uh, uh, the individual player is, in top and you do it with the players on Saturday and if you don't have the best players on the pitch yeah, they also need to know what to do uh, so take them during the week also with your plans and yeah, give them the same opportunity and the same guidance as the, the better players of your team so they, they, they are worth it and they, they need it so that's for me um, and, and for yourself, Stephen, obviously you've sort of touched on what you would communicate. Um, probably then to echo a little bit of what Hank said is uh, how how you communicate with, with the players. Is it a case of, because you only have that short amount of time, 10 minutes, is it a case again that you sort of questioning the players and drawing solutions out of them? Or is it really, okay, we need to do this, this, this and this? Yeah, so it's, it's quite similar. Um... To hang us in, we'll try and um, <clears throat> interlink our our work through the week, through those um, through those topics and what we've been working on, um, to try and put those into into the game on 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 the Saturday. And then obviously, when you get to the Saturday, you just get to drill down in more detail in terms of what it looks like, in terms of the specifics of the of the numbers and the strengths and weaknesses of obviously the the opposition. So playing out from the back is obviously playing out from the back, but how do you do it in a four against two strikers or how can you do it in a three against a, um, a front three utilising wingbacks or, or not having wingbacks, etc. So that Saturday just gives you um, more specifics on the detail of what the general topic looks like. But like Henk alluded to, we'll work through the week on um, on how we're going to do that. And, um, and the game is, is then more of um, an extension of the training week rather than like an isolated just incident um, or an isolated game on it on its own it's it's just a huge part of the of the training week um, and a huge part of their learning our learning um, the um, the building of the philosophy and, and the development of the of the philosophy and, and their individual development as players um, but in terms of communicating on match day we'll We'll have a we'll have a short video session pre-game. Um, I, I totally agree with Hank that if you've if you've worked well enough in the week, um, your Saturday should be um, should be more about the players. The players, if if we've done our job as coaches, their understanding will be better going into the game, and then they they need our help then as and as and when required. So pre-game we'll have the video session. At, um, during the game, 
in our setup at, at Leicester, um, the head coach will kind of oversee everything. My role is is more around the um, the negative transition and the out of possession work. Um, so rather than we work on the concept of rather than having his eyes um, and my eyes looking at the game in in the same way, rather than four eyes looking at the game in the same way, we've got two sets of eyes looking at the game through two different lenses. And then obviously anything that anything that I noticed um, from that, I can then pass to him. I'm effectively just giving him information to to make a call on um, on how we either change a player or um, what pro- what solution we come up with the problem that we're um, that we're having or um, anything that I'm noticing in the game that he maybe might not have noticed with him looking at um, alternative alternative elements and then ho- obviously he can then factor that into um, his decisions around half time substitutions change of tactics change of shape um, the other I think the other other beneficial of that is that we can maximise half time better that way because um, there's there's that trust in our work. So as we're on the way into the dressing room um, from the game at half time, that's when we'll um, that's when we'll have been formulating that, and maybe the last three or four minutes of the end of the first half, we will have been formulating what messages we want to get in and prioritising what messages we want to get across to the players in in that half time uh, period. And not only what messages, but who's going to deliver those messages. So, for example, we might split half time. Sometimes he might start with with his element around the whole game or around in possession, and then and then I might come in with um, uh, some out of possession observations. It, it largely depends on the game. It may be that there's some games where the problem that day isn't a tactical problem. Tactical that the problem that day might be more site based or it might be something completely different and he may just he may just lead the whole thing and sometimes I may not uh I may not intervene with the group. It may be that sometimes he delivers the the whole thing to the group and then I take the back four or something or, or the midfield four to um to get some messages into them. But we'll like I said we'll decide that kind of the last five minutes of the first half and on our way into the dressing rooms and prioritise what the message is going to be, who's going to deliver it, and how is it going to be delivered. Those those three things are really our our focus at going into half time. And then when we go back into the game again, my lens is more on um, out of possession, and his is on in possession and and the collective. Oh, perfect. So uh, I think we're. Uh just about out of time so before i wrap things up or sort of like henk whether you had uh, anything more to to add to today's session no i want to thank you for uh, the invitation and uh, i really enjoyed it and nice speaking uh, to you and uh, and steven and uh, hopefully we will meet each other on the pitch uh, someday and uh, yeah i wish everyone a, a very good day and a very uh, nice weekend last sunday uh, thank you, Hank. It's been a pleasure having you on and, and also with you, Stephen. Uh, have you uh, any final words? Yeah, just likewise. Thank, thank you for the, uh, for the invite and, uh, and the opportunity in the platform. Hank, thanks for your, um, your insight into, into your work and, and your experiences. I made a few notes and stuff that I, that I thought were, um, that were really good and, and really helpful to, to, for me to take away from it. So uh, I appreciate your, your insights and your, um, your openness with that. And, and then finally, I hope everybody who um, who gets to see it enjoys it and can take something from it themselves.